Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Joyner, founder and president of the Village Square. On behalf of the Village Square and Florida Humanities, we're delighted you've joined us tonight for The Way Out, How to Overcome Toxic Polarization with Dr. Peter T. Coleman. This program is part of a multi-year series of digital programs, Unum Democracy Reignite, Reignited, presented in partnership with Florida Humanities, exploring the past, present, and future of the American idea as it exists on paper, in the hearts of our people, and as it manifests in our lives. If you are not familiar with the work of Florida Humanities, we're putting their web address in the chat window. Be sure to check them out. This year, they're celebrating their 50th anniversary. You can ask questions at any time during the program. We encourage you to start asking them right away by clicking on the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. And if you haven't taken our pre-event survey yet, if you take just a moment to do so now, we're dropping the link into the chat thread too. Your honest answers will help the Village Square with a major nationally scoped research effort to better understand divisions in the United States. All your answers are anonymous. Even if you've done it, the survey for another program, we ask that you take a moment to do it again. We are delighted to welcome streaming partners to this evening, Bridge USA, Listen First Project, USC Center for the Political Future, Common Ground Committee, Braver Angels, McCourtney Institute for Democracy, National Institute for Civil Discourse, Civic Health Project, Unify, Talking Politics and Religion Without Killing Each Other podcast, Citizen Connect, Center for the Humanities at University of Miami, Network for Responsible Public Policy, and our wonderful long-term local media partners, the Tallahassee Democrat and WFSU Public Media. Now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's facilitator, Manu Meal. Manu is a social entrepreneur who is passionate about empowering young people. Protests on the campus of UCAL Berkeley over a planned visit by right-wing provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos inspired then-freshman Manu to establish what has now become Bridge USA, an organization that aims to promote democracy, not partisanship, and has chapters across the country. Manu was named to Forbes 30 Under 30 in Education, and he's the host of a fabulous new podcast, The Hopeful Majority, where he's interviewed leaders like Andrew Yang and Ibu Patel. Uh, we've put links in the chat window so you can learn more about both Bridge USA and The Hopeful Majority. Manu, I'm reading when I set this up, so I can't tell if I'm embarrassing you yet. But um, so just, just for good measure, um, I actually knew Manu almost a little bit after uh, his days at UCAL Berkeley as a freshman there. And it, uh, it used to be that I would like um, flatter myself and think that I could make important introductions of Manu to um, important people. That is no longer true. Um, Manu's got, um, Manu is the one who can introduce me to presidential candidates now. Um, I don't know a single one. No, Liz, you know, I, I'm so, I, I, every time you introduce me, I don't exactly know what to say next. And so I'm just grateful <laughs> to be here. I think this is what take four, take five of our, of our conversations. So. And, and, and I think we're in the same hotel. So yeah, it, yes, it yes, we are. We thought about broadcasting together, but we decided not to. So, but I may come um, knock on your door later on and surprise you. Well, th thank <laughs> you. Surprise thank our you. audience. Thank you so much for the work that you do. It really means a lot. And thank you to everybody on the background, whether it's Leon or Cassie um, or Eliza that helped put all this together. So why don't we get, get started with our program and let's, let's, shall we introduce Dr. Coleman? This sounds good. Sounds good. I'll see you on the other end, Liz. Uh, and again, it's great to be here with you. Thank you, everybody, so much for for joining. As Liz said, I help lead an organization called Bridge USA. Some of you might know me. Some of you might not know me. Somehow, I keep coming back to these things. So hopefully, I'm doing something okay. Um, I'm incredibly excited about today's conversation. Before I get right into the introduction of Dr. Coleman, who I've just found to be somebody that really illuminates the work, I would just say that this conversation is going to be split into a couple of parts, uh, and then we're going to go to your questions because those matter. And there's there's Dr. Coleman. So Dr. Coleman. Um, this is the only scripted part I have of this conversation where I introduce 
you. So I got to, I got to get through this because I think people ought to know who the, those who don't. Um, but you are a professor of psychology and education at Columbia University where you hold joint appointments. Uh, you direct the Morton Deutsch International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution. You have founded uh, and are directing the Institute for Psychological Science and Practice. And you're the co-executive director of Columbia University Advanced Consortium Cooperation, Conflict and Complexity. A lot of cooperation conflict going on. Um, and as everybody's about to see, Dr. Coleman is a renowned expert on constructive conflict resolution and his newest book, The Way out how to overcome polarization is really the subject of this conversation. So welcome, Dr. Coleman, um, and I'm excited for this conversation. Oh, thank you, Manu. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to, to, you know, think with you out loud. Yes, um, I think we all need to be thinking out loud. And again, for the audience, we will go to your questions because those are sometimes some of the most important. So please feel free to push back to offer insight because we want to think collectively. So this conversation, is gonna, uh, Dr. Coleman, I think we'll parse in three parts. Um, part one, the problem, what you think is the problem. Part two is is how we try and solve that problem. You talk about a path less traveled, so going through that. And then part three is just what we as individuals can do. So without further ado, how would you describe the problem that is um, toxic polarization, the challenge in our country? Uh, what is your assessment of where we are as a country, and how would you describe that problem? Thank you uh, for the for teeing that up. So I, I see the problem as ac acute. Um, hmm. I think that there are smart historians, John Meacham, Doris Kearns Goodwin, political scientists, Barbara Walter, others, that really are, are seeing the probabilities of a, of a civil war occurring again in this country as too high, um, that there's a decent likelihood of that. And what Barbara Walter argues is that, you know, civil war is not going to look like it did in the 1860s. It's going to look like, you know, violent groups, military groups, anti-government mm. groups and others um, taking out power substations and, you know, well-armed militia in a country where we have 340 million guns that we know of. Uh, we're a well-armed society. Um, and you have, I, I saw today a, a statistic that there are, I think, 702 anti-government hate groups that are organized mm -hmm. and being sort of tracked and monitored by the FBI. So, you know, it's it's a difficult time. It's, it's not a simple problem to talk about, but uh, sure. it has a long trajectory. This started we started to get worse on this dimension in the late 1970s. Um, and it's just continues to get worse in terms of how people feel about them and versus us. And also, in, you know, as we see in Washington and state politics, it's obstructionism that happens, the vitriol that we hear in political rhetoric. Um, so I think it's an acute problem. I think it's what I call a first order problem, which means that it's, right. it's affecting everything. Right. It's affecting what we do everywhere and our inability to address other major problems like climate change mm -hmm. and, you know, gun reform. It's almost like a, it's almost like a prerequisite, you would say, to solving a lot of the challenges that we see today. You know, what's interesting is, is you mentioned the statistic of of what did you say, 370 million guns that we don't or, or that we know of, um, yeah. which means there, there might be a bunch out there that we don't. Um, I don't know if this fact combined with the other fact that there's 330 million people that live in this country that all look differently than each other, that have so much religious diversity, ethnic diversity. Um, I don't know if it gives me more hope uh, and a sense of like perspective or despair to know that like the American experiment seems to be a very ambitious task. I mean, imagine if I told you there's 330 million people out there heavily armed, all looking different than each other, getting along and solving our problems. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, democracy is a ridiculous idea. <laughs> I yeah. happened to go to Athens this summer for the first time in my life and looked up at the Parthenon and, you know, wow. thought, um, what did what, what were they thinking? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that was a time when it was, you know, sort of generals in charge and it was all top down. And somebody said, you know, we could flip this and have the people basically have control over decisions and leadership. And so it's a it's a it's a crazy idea. And as, as the philosopher, you know, John Stewart of The Daily Show once said, democracy <laughs> is not natural. It goes against yeah. instincts. It's something that really has to be worked and cared and tended to. And we haven't been doing that very well. So it's interesting. I mean, I think Churchill had this quote that's something along the lines of democracy is the worst form of government, except for the rest of them or something like that. And right. I, I, I'm just curious, given that backdrop, 
that it almost actually sounds like polarization and division seem to be natural outcomes of of something so ambitious. Is that is that how you would think about it? Because I think part of the challenge right now is that people think that we're being hit by problems that are so unprecedented. And yet the way that you describe it, I would think it's kind of natural and, and makes sense. Or maybe yeah. there's something worse about today's polarization. Well, so polarization is uh, is actually a good thing. In a two-party system like ours, where you have you know progressives and conservatives that are challenging each other, it can be a really healthy check and balance. It can encourage us to find new insights and new ideas and innovate. Um, and, it, and it did, frankly, really since between like about 1924 and then the late 1970s, our hmm. government was able to function and you know uh, check, keep each other in check and move us forward. Um, however, we are in a state that I call toxic polarization. Other scholars call it pernicious polarization. There are a lot of terms for it. Basically, we're stuck in a runaway dynamic. And okay. it's not a simple thing to understand. It's complicated. There are a lot of things that drive it. But it's not politics as usual. It's not... Um, you know, healthy challenges. It's we really have got, gone off the rails. And that's the concern. And that's when political violence, the, op, the probabilities of political violence increases. And, the, and the, the data shows that. So so this isn't just polarization. It's a kind of polarization that almost takes on a life of its own. Mm. And even if you and I decide we don't want to do this anymore, we're exhausted, we're fed up, we want to try to do something else. We get sucked back into it uh, by so many things, the internet, media, you know, mainstream media, the political campaigns, our neighbors, our friends, you know, we get yeah. drawn into this thing that is in some ways bigger than us. And that's a, a different kind of problem. Well, when I was reading your book, The Way Out, you, I think what I really appreciate about the, the book and what you've done is you've been able to, I think, diagnose knows the problem in a pretty clear way. So do you think that there's, if we're to bring this conversation down to earth, do you think that there's certain factors that are driving this sort of runaway cycle? Like what, what about this moment do you think makes it so that it's so vicious in terms of its feedback loops? Yeah, that's, it's a good question. Um, so, you know, there are some things that matter more than others, right? Mm. But the truth is that there are many things um, you know, there's not one thing. This isn't about Donald Trump and how he chose to take up the presidency or campaigning. It's not about gerrymandering alone. It's not about social media and the like buttons and how we've become addicted to our devices. It is about how these major things sometimes align and start to feed each other, right? So the fact that you watch, we watch news that, that we find comforting, right? We, we quote, trust it. And we tr and, tr and trusting it when something new, uh, an event breaks, we turn to it. And so we watch that news and we tend not to watch news that contradicts that or makes us uncomfortable. And what that does just to our brain wiring is it makes it easy, you know, very easy to watch the news we want to watch or comfort news, but very hard to cha change the channel and listen to alternative points of view. So it starts to rewire our brains that becomes a self-reinforcing kind of vicious cycle because we don't turn to new to contrary inf information. Um, it's very easy not to. And so that's a micro dynamic. That is how a couple of things, our, our neural tendencies, our preferences, our comfort zone in terms of our politics and our ideology. And then, you know, what our friends and colleagues watch and talk about or don't, right? All of those things start to feed each other and lead us into a place where we we are one of the terms i've used is you know this is a kind of psychotic nation there are mm -hmm. two realities that are different fact patterns different information and when you talk to somebody on the other side you think what are, where are you living you know? <laughs> right right like what 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 what's going what what uh what water are you drinking you know <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, well, I want I want to get I want to get to the perception gap because it's I think yeah. it's really illuminating to see um, that actually there might be some nuance to how divided we might be. But a quick question that I just have when I think about these incentives, I mean, you describe the biological incentives and the neural incentives that it feels actually really good to read crazy news that drives us angry and and also 
that there's money to be made, that there's a profit incentive in all of this. It yeah. almost reminds me of like the conversation around junk food where yeah. like we love eating chips. There's no, there's no putting that. And there's a lot of money to be made in it too. Yeah. So how do you think about rewiring? And this is skipping ahead a little bit, but how do you think about rewiring some of those incentive structures? Because right now, if I was listening to this, I would say these are some pretty hard set facts to navigate. Yeah. Well, again, um, so yeah, I'm very pro chip. I'm very pro. <laughs> You're I all like, for the chips. <laughs> I like, you know, Fritos. I like them all. So uh, I'm guilty. And you're right to think about these things. You know, uh, junk food taps into our taste for salt and fat and sweet, and and it becomes addictive, right? Um, and one way to think about this era that we're in, this cultural dynamic that we're stuck in, is that it's like an addiction in that it is addiction specialist, I uh, studied addiction, I worked with addicts for a few, for several years. Um, addiction is considered a biopsychosocial structural problem. Mm, it's in our biology, our neurology, it's in our psychology and our relationships, it's in the structures of in, uh, the, you know, inequality and our inability to get jobs or, you know, it's all, it's on multiple levels and so what what you know the aa movement understands is that even if an addict wants to change they oftentimes can't there're just too many components that trigger them and move them back into the addiction and that's a decent metaphor for what we're mm -hmm. we're struggling with right the the individual characteristics or consequences of our alienation from half the country and you know many of us most of us in this country are alienated from somebody in our family, you know? Right. People we used to go to Thanksgiving with and tolerate or have some laughs with, we can't stand them anymore. That contributes to sort of loneliness and, you know, alienation and depression and anxiety and all of that stuff. So these are complicated mm -hmm. dynamics that are happening. Um, and so, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to kind of essentialize what the problem is. But what we've been trying to do is understand frankly, study societies that have been here and have managed to get out. What do places like Costa Rica, the Scandinavian countries, New Zealand, Mauritius and Africa, Botswana, what are the things that they did when they were either in a civil war or on the verge of a civil war or coming out of a terrible time and actually started to pivot? Like what were the conditions that encouraged a group of people to sort of say, no, <laughs> we wanna take a different direction. Um, and what was the timing on that? What were the conditions mm -hmm. that encouraged that, right? So, uh, and then what did they do? That's one of the things we've been studying here for 25 years is these more intractable conflicts. And when they stop and when they change course and how does that happen? And so that's really well, what, what the book what, is written about, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think when folks pick up the book, I think they'll see the the nuance of the problem, but also that it's it's actually within grasp. This is yeah. skipping ahead, but let's just go there. Like, what did those countries do? What did what did a Costa Rica do? Or I know I know it's tough to narrow down on specifics and then draw generalizations. But what were sort of the key takeaways? Well, again, one key thing that happened in all of these places, but Costa Rica is a good example. Is in 1948 they came out of a terribly bloody civil war where thousands of people were slaughtered. And there was something about that, that crisis, that catastrophe, that encouraged the leadership and the citizenship to say, we don't ever want to do this again. We really want to take, take the reins and do something totally different. So then they did some significant things. They, just, they uh, basically deconstructed their military. They took the money from that and put it into education and business and ecotourism and that kind of thing. And they chose to make some fundamental socialization choices. They said, we need to grow a new population. We need to grow children that toler can tolerate differences, can respect each other, can work out their conflicts fair fairly and constructively. So they mandated a curriculum around peace education and conflict resolution and, the, and tolerance uh, in all schools. And so they believed that they you know, they did these kind of macro things to change the conditions, and they felt like they grew another a new population over time, right? So that takes a long time. And, it, it, you know, it's not something that you see change in in the short term. But mm -hmm. they were miserable enough as a people and their leaders, uh, you know, one of the leaders had, had been a, a general, a militant. And, and they really said, we don't ever want to do this to each other again. 
And that's, you know, th that's frankly right. where we could be today. Because so many of us, you know, what the more in common folks call the exhausted majority, sure. the vast majority of us are fed up, exhausted, don't want this anymore. Well, Dr. Coleman, it's now the hopeful majority. We're 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 rebranding it. Good. And and, I like and, that. and and the reason is like, who wants to be part of the exhausted majority? You know? <laughs> um, well, well, okay, let me let me ask you this. So you know, there, there's these examples of countries that have done fascinating things to try and address and, and sort of reorient their societal structures. Yeah. Where my mind goes to this is I can imagine people in the audience right now thinking, well, you know, it's important for us to tolerate differences. It's important yeah. for us to think through some of these nuances, but maybe some conflicts are just meant to be had. Maybe there's yeah. some issues that we just have to fight over. Yeah. How do you respond to that sentiment? Well, I agree completely. I mean, again, I'm like I'm pro chip. I'm pro conflict. I think conflict. I think is you a... might be the first doctor to be pro chip, by the way. You <laughs> should go on record. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I think that conflict is the um, kind of just is. You know, I, I, I ask my students because I teach a course in the science of conflict resolution. Um, it is just a, uh, it's like sex. Mort Deutsch, my mentor, talked about conflict as being equal to sex because it's a natural phenomenon. We need it. We can thrive. It has pathologies, but it also has extraordinary benefits for us as a species. Conflict, the same thing. If we don't have conflict, we don't learn, right? If you don't have a new idea come in and challenge your assumptions, you don't really learn. And conflict is important we find in marriages and relationships, right? That there's some conflicts you change and grow together and that scales all the way up to society. So conflict is a, is a good thing. Um, it can be a good thing. Um, that's what this center was built on is studying the conditions under which conflicts go well or go poorly for the people involved, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not that, again, polarization is a bad thing. It's not that conflict is a bad thing. They're necessary parts of our of the human condition, and certainly of progress, right, and change and reform. But they can't. We can get off the rails. We can lose the kind of norms and taboos and guidelines. One of the things we studied. I have this team of people that study these sustainably peaceful societies. We had a paper in Nature come out about two years ago that compared. 15 what we call peace systems, which are societies that are peaceful with a lot of their neighbors and non-peace systems. And the most important thing was that peace systems are places, and they're, they're, there are scores of these around the world, they're places where there are norms, values, and taboos and rituals that celebrate peace, that really embrace it and recognize it as a value and as something that they're proud of and aspire to. Mauritius is a great example of this. Very proud of the fact that they're the highest most peaceful nation in the continent of, Af of Africa. Think about think about uh, the mall in Washington, D.C. Where's the peace? There are so many ways that we honor war and warriors and the sacrifices made there. There's no place really where we honor peace and the peace builders and the peacemakers. We're not a country that does that. Culturally, that's a problem, right? That's fascinating. That's yeah. fascinating. I, I would, I'm resisting going down a line of questioning that is, uh, that is tangential to your book about just what does that actually mean for the human psychology that we celebrate war much more than we celebrate peace. And I think you could probably find some nuggets in that to solve this problem before we transition to sort of yeah. how to potentially diagnose and fix the problem. Yeah. We touched a little bit on perceptions and, yeah, yeah. you know, one of these weird phenomena that I experience, and I know many of those listening experiences that you'll see you know, craziness on the news, but in person, people seem pretty all right. Um, you know, you'll go through rural communities, you go through urban communities, and if you talk to them independently, they'll largely describe similar problems, maybe with different vocabulary, different words. Yeah. And I often feel like the history of this era might not be written as the great divide, but the great misunderstanding, which sounds incredibly naive. But no. could you go a little bit into your research, into what the book says about our perception gaps? Yeah, yes. Yeah, happy to do that. And again, the, um, I think a lot of the work I cite in there comes from the group more in common. There are others yep. that study yep. misperceptions, but they too have been studying the perception gap. They study polarization around the world and in the U.S. Uh, and one of the things they found, and there is actually a simple online assessment that you can take. And I took it 
part of what we'll talk about when we get to solutions is yep. that we've created this kind of challenge, which are small things you can do every day to kind of, you know, think about these problems differently and start to shape new norms and habits for yourself. Um, and one of the things we ask you to do is take their survey. And it's a perceptual survey about how much do you think they, the other party, you know, believe on what do they believe in these issues? How extreme are they? How how uh, active are they? You know, how aggressive are they on these things? I took this survey um, a year ago when I was doing was developing this challenge, um, and I knew what the survey was doing. All right, I knew, <laughs> I knew how it worked. <laughs> you know, I'm a methodologist; I understand those things, and I was still thirty percent off on my perceptions of the other side. I thought that they were much more extreme, 30% more extreme on average on all of these different issues than they actually are. That's the misperception wow. gap. And that's fed by a lot of things. It's fed by social media and mainstream media where the more extreme voices get more attention, right? I think there's a study on Twitter that shows that about 80% of the content is placed by 10% of the more extreme and politically engaged individuals the rest of us process it. So if we're hearing that stuff all the time, of course we think they're extremists, right? But right. it's not accurate. It's a, it's an inaccurate perception, but it is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If mm -hmm. I believe you're crazy, then when you lay out your position, I am going to react in a much more extreme way and we set each other off, right? Right. That dynamic is part of this runaway train. It's a key problem. And there are some simple remedies to it. Just knowing how wrong we usually are in our assessment of the other starts to introduce some kind of doubt and loosens things up a little bit so that we're a little bit less reactive to others. Hmm. You know, the organization that you briefly mentioned starts with us, which is a great organization doing a lot of good work on pushing new narratives on social media, because if we can't uh, get rid of social media, we might as well leverage it. And one of the data points that you just cited, they talk about 87% of Americans are tired of our divisions. I think in your book, you cite 83% are stressed about the, the direction of our country. So there seems to be wide alignment as well around this problem. So as we shift a little bit to the solutions part, you outline this distinction between cloud and clock problems. And yeah. you've described, you know, this problem of polarization having to do with institutions and social media and us as individuals. It's not just Trump, you know, or it's not just Biden. It's yeah. a collective. Could you go a little bit into how to first frame it as a cloud versus clock problem? Could you go into what you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. So this this distinction of clocks and clouds has been around for a bit since the 60s. Um, uh, Karl Popper, who was a you know very right. influential philosopher of science, offered us this. And he basically said in science and in life, there are two, you know, two categories of problems. One are clock problems that are fixable, right? There are things that, so you, if your clock breaks down, you can take it apart, you can replace the str spring, put it back together, and it functions as it did before. And he argues that in science, that's really the model that we've used to solve problems, is that you want to find the thing that's broken in the, you know, in the relationship, in people's attitudes, in an organization, in a community, you find the things that are broken and you try to repair them. And that's sufficient to solving the patterns that you see. What he argued is that that's a particular kind of problem and, and fixes, you know, going in and fixing the clock is very useful a lot of the time, probably the most, most of the time. But he argued that there are many problems that are, are cloudy problems. They're not mm -hmm. clocks. They're not static. They're not, you can't identify the thing or a couple of things to fix. They're dynamic and they're changing and they're feeding each other. These elements are kind of increasing each other over time. They, they have a different set of rules. And so he argued that, you know, we really need to think about those kind of, kinds of problems differently. And I see this problem as a cloud problem because it's been increasingly worse since the 19, late 1970s on many different kind of metrics, depending on what you're measuring, but simply in terms of our feeling for them versus our feeling for our own group, right? Mm -hmm. But on many other measures, um, this is getting worse and worse, including political differences uh, or political violence, and including the fact that we are physically moving away from each other, right? Not just 
the rural urban divisions that have been happening for decades. But even within cities, the, the Times had a, had a study on this a, a year ago where they were mapping within major cities the pockets of red and blue are getting tighter and tighter. The red is moving away from blue, vice versa. I heard in a statistic about the midterm, last midterm elections that something like 90 some percent of the uh, precincts are now considered pure red or blue. Yeah, I saw purple, that. Right. So that just means that we're literally physically moving away from each other. And what we know from societies where you see terrible spikes in violence is that when you have large groups of people that live fairly near to each other, but don't have daily contact, mundane contact, you know, at the store, mm -hmm. playing soccer, or hanging out at a pub. If you don't have that kind of contact with people that are different from you, then the, the likelihood that conflict turns violence, it escalates. It escalates because you don't you don't know the people. I mean, there's no sense of connection. I well on on our podcast, the hopeful majority. I think two weeks ago or so, we had Andrew Yang on, and Andrew yeah. talked about again, sort of some of the institutional fixes that he's thinking about. You know, they've got yeah. obviously the forward party. They've got a lot of stuff around gerrymandering, et cetera. But yeah. the thing that you're still describing is very individual, right? Like you could you could suddenly tomorrow, let's say, um, resolve the issue of gerrymandering, and yet. I still don't know my neighbors and I yeah. I've lived next to them for three years in a, in a building and we like literally are two feet apart. Um, yeah. What do you think is, it's odd. Like as a young person, I think about this, we live at one of the most connected times in human history because of social media. And yet we also live at one of the most disconnected times. Why do you think that that irony exists? Well, that's interesting. I mean, I think they probably feed each other because the connections on social media, as you know, sort us into our, like groups with like attitudes. And so there is a tendency in that space for us not to be with people that are different from us, but that are similar to us. So that's part of what's driving it. But I think that, the, you know, there's a, there's a great book by Sebastian Younger called Tribe. And it's really right. a book about vets returning to America and the difficulty coming from a war zone and coming back here and making sense of your life. But also the fact that when they come back, we don't really do anything for them. We don't mm. really welcome them. We don't really understand what they were doing or appreciate what they were doing. We don't provide them with the kind of support that they need to come back and, you know, and make and basically return to a life here. Um, but one of the things he argues is that as countries get wealthier and wealthier, we basically need each other less, right? If something happens, if there's a fire now, we call the fire department. That's interesting. Right? If you call the cop, if there's a break in, you call the cops. You don't really depend on your neighbors. And the wealthier you get, the bigger your lawns are, the bigger your hedges are, the further away you are you know, <laughs> right. from each other. And so there is this tendency yeah. that we're losing this profound need that we have for each other. Let me tell you one thing that evolutionary biologists tell us about Please. why humans need each other. Humans and chimps share about 95% of our DNA. Uh, um, so, you know, basically we're very similar, right? Um, and there's... There are people like Franz de Waal that study conflict resolution and reconciliation in chimps, and there's a lot of parallels. There's about 5% of our DNA that's different. A lot of it's just random stuff. It's kind of meaningless. There are two things that distinguish us from chimps. One is this thumb, right? We have this opposable thumb, and this allows us to have, use different tools and play tennis and all that stuff. Sure. Um, the other is that our prefrontal cortex, the, our cognitive function, executive functioning part of our brain um, takes so long to develop. Chimps, when they're born as infants, in two weeks have a fully functioning prefrontal cortex, which means they can find food, they can find shelter, they can, you know, get out of, they can flee when they need to. They, they're thinking, right? Mm. We take two years in order to develop this. And what evolutionary biologists believe is that, therefore, we are totally dependent on each other to survive. If we didn't have caretakers of cer certain types, we just wouldn't be, we wouldn't survive as a species. It's critical because it takes us so long to get to a place where we're sufficiently independent. So we're hardwired to really need each other, to need community, to need support from the very beginning. That is the nature of our species at this point in, in evolution. And we forget that because again, the, 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 we, we have this myth, mythology of independence. We're a very you know, rugged, independent right. nation. 
Well, that's not true. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Said that's dependent on each other for eons. We still need each other. And yet we have this fantasy that we don't. So I'll, I'll tell you, if people are wondering if uh, that why we're going in very interesting directions because there's no script, but now I'm totally going off, completely off the script. Great. I have to ask you this. So yeah. I, you know, we're having these conversations and you're talking about human nature. You're talking about the fact that we need a sense of dependency that we've yeah. forgotten that until there is a crisis. Yeah. Now we're crisis sticks to me. So every time my friends and I uh, are like ending the day and we're just having conversations, we always end up at at the very pessimistic notion that man it feels like we might need a war and mm. i don't i don't mean that from a yeah. from a standpoint of that would be a good thing but from a standpoint of a lot of people are starting to say that you know if we were children we've just gone way too far that they just got to let us fight yeah. um yeah. how do you respond to that notion because it seems like historically i mean we have had incredibly divided times and yet yeah. it seems like there was a lot of good stuff that happened but also a major conflict happened whether it was foreign or domestic yeah. Well, certainly wars can be a correction. Wars can bring a correction and bring peace. They can also bring the, the opposite. They can bring protracted eras of violence and enmity and frustration. And then you have a victor, but you have the losers that have resentments that bubble for long periods of time. You know, they're, they're, wars are complicated things. I mean, what we know from war is that when societies tip into violence as the as the main way of solving problems then we're in huge trouble because the the we become addicted to that we see that as the final solution no pun intended and it becomes uh, much the probability that we'll even if we come to some tr tr treaty or agreement the probability that we'll slip back to violence immediately increases mm. it, once you tip into violence so it's a very slippery slope. It is, if you've ever been in a war zone or experienced anything like that up front, it's a horrible existence, right? Absolutely. Just an unbelievably horrible existence. I met a young woman here yesterday who's a new student in my class, who's a Ukrainian uh, young woman who's just moved here and started a program in peace and justice and reconciliation. And her family is still being bombed there. It's it's a it's a it's a horrible reality, um, and I understand at a macro level it can be good for economics and it can change the game in terms of needs and bringing the country together, but it doesn't always necessarily do that. Think about one thing that I think is interesting is so there is a whole theory called punctuated equilibrium, equilibrium which means that most change happens so sort of slowly incrementally. Right major change happens after some big, some big calamity or yeah. and a war can be one a coup attempt can be another you know january 6 could be one right um but not necessarily think about the 9 11 effect here right 9 11 happened there was you know i was in new york city i dropped my kids off for their first day of school that morning i came to, to columbia Suddenly, my, my lab was meeting for the first time, and everything shut down. The phones didn't work. We knew there was a crisis. We heard what was happening. I literally went out and ran downtown to pick up my kids because they were, you know, in chaos in the middle of the school. Um, so it was a huge political shock. It disoriented us. It um, And did it unite the country? No. It did for... For what? like... Two, two years. Yeah, yeah, there was like yeah. kind of two months of people beating on corners and lighting candles and singing. and But pretty quickly, it became sort of weaponized. Even in my classes, it became weaponized with people on very different opinions about who was at fault, what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it didn't ultimately bring the Congress together or the Senate right. together. You know, well, so, uh, so some just, of the shocks don't do what we think they're going to do. Um, yeah, that's one of the problems. Yeah, I, I again, like out of full transparency, I think most of the people know this by now, but like I was two years old, you know, when 9 11 happened, and yeah. I, I was actually living, uh, my parents lived here, but I, I was living in India, and I distinctly yeah. remember now looking back, one of the pictures that people often talk about is that day in the evening. Um, all members of Congress, I think, held a vigil 
in front of the Capitol. And it was yeah. it was a fascinating instance of not just bipartisanship, but humanity. Yeah. And I guess my question for you is that you've set up this very complicated situation that has um, a, a biological tendency to it that has an institutional tendency to it. And so you've really set up a real problem to solve. And so yeah. I can imagine right now that I'm listening, I'm like, well, Dr. Coleman, you know, good luck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> are, are you, are, I, I know, I know you've written your book and I'll yeah. read it, but man, I'm in a tough spot. So, so yeah. it seems like some of the stuff that you've been doing, for example, like the political courage challenge that you referenced earlier yeah. is stuff that people as individuals can take. Let's transition a little bit to individual action. What sure. do you think are the things that we as people can be doing in our daily lives, yeah. uh, given that there's a lot that we can't control? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And again, I, I, I don't want to be overly pessimistic. I, I think this is a, a no, a, I think it's important. Yeah. It's important. I think it's a serious, urgent problem. I think we, we misunderstand it because we think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a clock problem. We can yep. go fix ger gerrymandering or, or, you know, bring back some regulations on the internet or social on media, you know, that we can do these things and that will, it will change the dynamic, but it's a bigger problem than that. So how we understand the problem is really important. Um, and I want to say that the reality is we are in the midst of a major political shock, right, of, mm. of, of politics, the intensity, January 6th, the indictments against Trump, the, the um, you know, what's happening with the Supreme Court and some of those decisions. We are at a sure. time of tumult and we're just coming out of COVID, really, where right. millions have, have died many unnecessarily, uh, an economic downturn, a time of racial reckoning and awareness of, from white folks like me of racial injustice at a different level. We are a nation destabilized. That is ultimately a promising time. It, it, That's the interesting part. I, want, I would love for you to emphasize this further, that actually this offers an opportunity. That's what, so there's a, there's a, people in international affairs that study something called ripeness and it's when you have warring parties that are trying to kill each other how do you can how do you get, ever get them to the table to start to talk about negotiations and peace and treaties and there's a, the primary theory on that is something called ripeness theory and it is when a you have enough people that are fed up exhausted and miserable and they really don't see a way you know, a, a violent or contentious way out of this. They feel trapped. It's a stalemate. And if and, and that's where we are as a country. That is oftentimes a necessary condition. What you also need is what you're, the question you're asking me right now is, what do you do? What's the alternative? How do we, what, what does something else look like, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really critical thing to move to. It's why I wrote this book because I feel like it's helpful to understand the problem. There's a lot of people writing great stuff, Ezra Klein's book, others writing great stuff about the problem. Sure. But there was not, I think, a sufficient information about what the science has told us of societies that have pivoted and got out of traps like this. What do you do? And so that's mm. you know what I, I, I would like to talk to. Maybe one way I can do that, if it's okay, is just to tell a quick story. Absolutely. And, and before you before you tell that story, I would just remind everybody that please feel free to submit any questions that you've got for us, because we will try to get to as many of them as possible, because we're trying to think through this together. So go ahead, Dr. Coleman. Yeah. Yeah. I just again, I want to make it kind of real and tell you how I did this. Please, right? please. So so I wrote this. I published this book the way out two years ago. Then last summer, I started to think about me and how I live my life. And am I am I using these things practically? And so um, one of the things that had happened is I started to kind of just think about who in my life am I alienated from because of politics. And one person really came to mind, which is, a, so I live in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I live in a building. And there was a man that I've known for 15 years, um, known him to be a, you know, a father, his kids seem lovely, grandfather. You know, I, I've seen him, you know, a decent guy, he's a businessman, um, but, Sometime a couple of years ago, he started to talk to me about his politics. And my view of his politics was that they were fairly insane. Like he would say, hey, if, I, if I may, things about Putin, and supporting sure. Putin and think he's a great leader. And, and for me, uh, my reaction was, 
I don't, I don't want to have these conversations. It felt that it's just like he was trying to provoke. He was trying to trigger me. And, and this was happening more and more. So at some point, I just thought, I'm out. I can't engage with this guy anymore. I, I just got to give it up. But then last year, I thought, I can't do this. I have to try to figure wow. out some way to engage that would shift this dynamic. And so I, I emailed this man and I said, would you, would you be willing to uh, take a walk with me in the park? Hmm. And um, <clears throat> it took him a little bit, but he wrote back and sort of said, happy to talk to you, maybe sit down on a bench, but like, why are we walking in the park? Are you CIA? <laughs> are you trying, you know, you're a psyop. <laughs> yeah. Do you want, do you, are you afraid of surveillance? Is that what this is? Is it a setup? So I said, I, I will explain it to you. Sure. Um, but eventually he agreed. And so we agreed to spend this time. And what I'm going to talk through is just briefly is what happened. Absolutely. And all of what happened was my attempt to sort of live the principles that I talk about in this book, which are five things. And the first thing was like that you have to sort of stop and ask yourself, what are you doing? What do you want to do, right? I can meet with him. I could easily have gotten to a conversation with him that went bad fast, right? He'd say something, I'd say, what are you talking about? That's insane. And cite different statistics and off we go. And we know how that goes, right? So I thought to myself, what do you want to do here? And I really thought I, I want to take advantage of the opportunity to learn from somebody who I think is a decent person, but seems to be very misguided or at least in a very different world. I have to try to understand what's going on here. So I want to learn. And what I knew is if I went into it with, you know, my, you know, it, uh, loaded for bear, right. Mm. That I knew what would happen. So we met, we went for a walk, which was intentional. It's one of the principles that when you walk with people who differ from you, there's a value to moving. There's value in the physical movement together, ideally side by side and outside, if you can, because there's something about that, that we don't do, very, you know, I'm a peace builder and a mediator. And usually what we do is see, sit people across from each other and have them talk right. at each other. And that works well with low level conflicts, but not if they're true believers, then it just goes bad fast. Walking can help. So I asked him to take a walk with me. We went out. The first thing I said is, can you tell me, who are you? Tell me about you. Where'd you come from? How'd you grow up? What's your story? So he told me his story and it was a, actually a very interesting and nuanced story. And suddenly some of his values and connections to more conservative Politics made sense to me. I understood what the connections were. I did the same. I kind of told my story. We found some common ground, um, which helped. And then I, he said, so tell me, you know, what, what do you want to talk about? And I, he said, I, I know I'm probably the only Republican that you know that you want to talk, that you can talk to. And I said, well, not really. And he said, I'm probably the only Trump supporting Republican, you know. And I said, yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> so, so I said, can you explain to me what, how, why you feel so strongly about him, so much support for him? And then we continued to walk. And I would say for the next 15 to 20 minutes, he went through and got very passionate, the talking points that came from Breitbart and Fox and other sure. places about the conspiracy theories and George Soros. And, and he really went into these things. And he was expecting me to say, ah, you're wrong. I got it. I'll tell you why. Which is an urge that many of us find relatable. Immediately, you, you feel compelled to do this. But I was intentional about, I wanted to try to understand this and, and hear him out. And so I didn't. All I did is I asked clarifying questions. So you, you're in your community, you can do this, but not this. And okay, that's interesting. And just went on and I and allowed him to talk and listen to him. It really was tracking. And what happened ironically, is that, well, first of all, let me, let me preface one thing. Before I met with him, I was sick to my stomach. Mm -hmm. I'm a conflict resolver, but this is a conflict with me. It's something I felt very anxious about. I felt nauseous about it. He was clearly anxious when I met him. He was, he did, he was like, uh, my wife's not feeling well. I may have to come back pretty soon. <laughs> I was like, okay. That's okay. the interesting thing. When the conflict is with you, it's much more visceral. Yep. It's much, yeah. And so we were both in that place, but we walked it off and he in some ways talked it off. And part of what happened because I didn't, because of what the, the, the dance that we were doing wasn't what he expected, which was a debate. 
I just listened. And he ultimately came to his own um, doubts about mm -hmm. his thinking, his side, his should this guy run for president again? Probably not. He did all these stupid things in Arizona and whatever. So he started to kind of shore up his own arguments with his own critique of his own side. And it was kind of fascinating because it was, you know, in some ways it was a, a jujitsu move. I didn't do it intentionally to trap him. I really was just trying to understand. But because of it, and there is science on this, that if you ask people who have strong beliefs about something to explain them, what happens is most of us realize we don't really know. We don't yeah. have much information about it, right? Yeah. Anyway, the, the, the value is ultimately we came back, we connected in a way, um, you know, it, it didn't change the world, it didn't change him or me, but it changes our experience of each other and my experience of kind of the other side, just to a large degree. I gave him my book, he read it. <laughs> he there read, you go. Right? <laughs> Which, you know, surprised me. Um, and we've met since then. And we send each other articles. And so we're staying, we're keeping the conversation going. So what's what's interesting about this is that, you know, one of the concepts that also comes through your book is this notion of positive deviance, right? Where you're trying to find and build these types of really productive relationships. And yeah. the question that comes to my mind, and as, as Liz is dropping in the chat, yeah. there are hundreds of organizations and people doing this work. And it's like, imagine if we could do this at scale. But yeah. I want to ask you a slightly thorny question, because yeah. I think part of the reason why I think a lot of this work is running into some difficulties is because we're not thinking, I think, about why this isn't breaking through. And one of the things that I can imagine someone asking you, uh, because I was asked this a lot too, as we went through college campus and we went through UC Berkeley and we went through the protests, which is that you have the privilege to be able to engage in those conversations. Yeah. That you as somebody that might not, let's say, and again, these are assumptions I'm making, but I can see some of these questions coming, that you yeah. have the privilege to be able to engage in that conversation, but maybe somebody that uh, is in a very different position. Let's yeah. say you take the Putin stance and let's say that you are somebody with Ukrainian heritage. Yeah. Like, how do they have that conversation? So how do you respond to this notion that you have the privilege to be able to engage these conversations and that maybe that's an expectation that we can't place on everybody else. I think that's a really valid point. And I think we have to take that seriously. I mean, um, you know, I, uh, my background is not what I look like. I came from poor people, you know, food stamps, aid to dependent children, uh, single parent family. Where'd you grow up? Uh, well, I was born in Chicago, okay. and then um, we fled Chicago, my mother and my mm -hmm. siblings and I, because of my father was involved in some illegal things, mm -hmm. and they were threatening us. So we fled the state and moved to Iowa. So I grew up in Iowa. I grew up, I, I grew up in elementary school and high school in Dubuque, Iowa. And um, we were poor, and my father was gone. And um, my mother did, you know, hard jobs. And so I, I lived there and I grew up with people that I understand um, look at someone like Trump as a folk hero because mm -hmm. the system has failed them and they're outraged about that. And one way to respond to that is just to break it down. And Trump does that, right? So I I come from a place where I have a lot of, experience and relationships that I uh, that helps me understand that, right? So I guess what I wanna say in reaction to your question is, I think that it's so true that I am in a place where I am able to do that. But what's also true is that anybody can do this with their brother-in-law at Thanksgiving, right? right? You may have someone in your family that goes off the rails, drinks too much, starts to say crazy things. And it's a hard thing and it messes the family up and it messes up holidays and people more and more are dreading, are, are avoiding Thanksgiving or these family holidays or just sh cutting them short. Um, so part of what I've been saying is, well, if there is someone that's going to do that, one way to head it off is to call them a week or two in advance and say, would you take a walk with me? Can we spend mm -hmm. some time together? And, you know, and ultimately create conditions where maybe the likelihood of that happening is less, right? Um, you have yeah. some sense of efficacy then. It's not just a hopeless thing, my crazy brother-in-law or uncle, whatever. 
you can you can do something to try to change that dynamic, but it has to be intentional and you have to be kind of smart about what you're doing because you can't just wander into it or it will backfire. I, I appreciate you sharing your personal story because I think oftentimes when people are hearing us talk about this stuff, they're like, oh, you know, uh, Dr. Coleman's an academic, he can do it. Or, yeah. you know, Manu's this random nerd, you know, and he, he, can, he can go off and like read all the books and do his thing. But it, it really is something that we as everyday people can do. And one thing that I've deeply appreciated about this conversation, Dr. Coleman, is that you have a really fantastic ability to distill what are pretty complicated notions into something that we as people can do. This is the, this is the last piece that I want to end with. And, and again, for the audience, please welcome all your questions and we're going to try to get through them as much as possible. The exciting thing is we've got a lot of questions for you. So I think that means right. that we're, we're doing something, um, <laughs> right. in your time, uh, a series of articles that you wrote in Time Magazine with our mutual friend, Pierce Godwin. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you talk a lot about is that the red and blue secret is that we actually all need each other. Yeah. Um, you talk about, you know, the, the uncle of Thanksgiving. Yes, you get you all get into brawls, but we actually do need our family. So yeah. with that nugget, why do we need each other? Yeah. And what can we do with that necessity? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, there we are in the midst of an epidemic of loneliness and alienation. We feel more and more detached, depressed, stressed, anxious, suicidal ideations up, particularly for younger people. Um, it's a hard time. You know, we're mm -hmm. in an extremely hard time. I mean, I have to say, particularly right after COVID, during and right after COVID, my students here are anxious, they're physically sick, they're emotionally struggling, they're really, really having hard times. That's the nature of our of our society right now. That's a a, a reflection of our culture, um, and 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 loneliness, a lack of social contact with people that you used to have relationships with and no no longer talk to, is part of that problem, right? It's part of this dynamic is that we just pull away from each other. Um, so there is a a profound need for us to make these connections and find ways to do it that we're comfortable with, right? I'm not saying. If your neighbor is a KKK member that you rush in and throw your arms around them and say, I love you, I believe in you. <laughs> no, right? First of all, one of the things I want to say is that this is based on the misperception stuff is they're not all alike. You know? Right. One of the things I've tried to do over the past couple of years is intentionally find people that have different, fundamentally different political beliefs from me who are decent, well-informed and well-intentioned. And so when the news breaks and I want to go to my news and listen to that, I also look for them. I look How do you seek out those people in your life? Well, I've found them over time. So some of them are, are people locally, like my neighbor, where we've established this relationship. Um, and I feel like I can be honest with him. But then some of them are pundits who, and I'm, I'm very clear about this. What I don't do is go for the conflict entrepreneurs, the crazy voices, the people that are saying anything to get attention. And there are a lot of politicians that do that. And, that there, and there are a lot of certainly media people that do that and social media people. I don't, I don't do that. It's not helpful to me. Hmm. But I do find people, for example, one of the things we haven't really talked about, but there is this thing in Congress called the Select Committee for the Modernization sure. of Congress. And now there's a thing called the Bipartisan Working Group, which has been there for a while. And these are people that are good people. I went to the, met the bipartisan working group this summer and talked to them about this stuff and listened to them. And, you know, there are people living in under very dif difficult circumstances right now. Some of them have to travel with armed guards. They have death threats, right? That's led by Derek Kilmer. They Congress have death threats. Yeah. Uh, Kilmer has, he said the summer, three um, warrants out against people that, you know, are, are basically mm -hmm. stalking him and threatening his family. So they're living under extremely, extremely difficult circumstances. Two of them said to me, I would resign today because this job is horrible right now. And he said, I can't, if I go to a town hall, I get attacked. If, if I'm on the street, I can get attacked. He's, they said, I would leave today if I felt like somebody decent would step in, but they're not. So I, I'm stuck here. And mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is that these politicians in the epicenter of political polarization in this country, Congress, where January 6th happened, and where many of them had to barricade themselves in their office to survive, um, they 
are coming together and making a difference and figuring out ways to change the culture in Congress and to find bipartisan solutions to our problems. And they're doing that. There are what we call positive deviants or examples yep. of groups under the worst possible circumstances coming together and in and, and good faith making good progress. That's hopeful. We need it. We have to do that. And so finding groups that are doing that effectively is one way to start. And that hopeful minority of people is actually a majority because I think most people, especially folks listening to this, but I think most people out there are on the same page in that they want to live in a country where their kids do better than themselves. They want to live in a country where we all feel respected. They want to live in a country where they can walk and move with their neighbor and find those positively deviant interactions that make them feel better. And yeah. one of the things that inspires me is, I mean, when I started this work, or as Liz was saying, as a freshman year, Dr. Coleman, yeah. in 2017, since then, I mean, I've only seen an uptick in the level of individuals, powerful folks, people across the political spectrum getting involved and taking action. And and I think it's within all of us to take that action. I just, before we get into the Q&A, I just want to flag again the challenge that you and Start With Us have worked on. Yeah. called the the political courage challenge because it's something that anybody can take is that right yeah yeah so what we've done is just you know there's this book and the book has five kind of scientific principles that we think are helpful but again nobody reads books anymore and so we said all right so uh, if you I read live, books okay well you and i read <laughs> there are some handful but you know you know what i mean they're it's not for sure. no i know what you mean so we thought, how do we make this useful to people? How do we really help them try it out? And so we created a challenge, which mm -hmm. is a four-week thing. And we're setting it up so that if you register for it as of October 1st, you'll get a, note, a, a text every day or you'll get an email that says, okay, uh, follow this link and here are three exercises. You can try any of them. And it's as little as five minutes a day. First week, you reflect on you and your tendency, your more divisive tendencies and inclinations and your perception, misperception, that, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. The second week is important because it's about your friend group, the people that you're comfortable talking politics with, but who, frankly, you're not probably very honest with anymore because that's what's happening more is more is that we're very careful with our in-group uh, to not cross a line or say something that they're going to doubt or challenge. So how do you reintroduce nuance and honesty mm -hmm. and tolerance in your own in-groups? Third week is how do you reach out across the divide? And the fourth week is identifying these groups, these thousands of bridge building organizations that are in almost every community in this country that are already bringing people together, oftentimes in service of, of local concerns. These groups mm -hmm. come up and they say, you know, there's something happening and we need to come across, come together across the political divide and deal with this issue of taxes or water or, you know, life stuff, jobs, homelessness. They find ways to come together. Um, so that is a very promising thing. A practical thing. that people and, it, and the challenge just give you, gives you a daily thing to try out, to start right. to develop new habits and norms ultimately that can help us grow a different type of, type of society over time. And I think we need all types of those different interventions, especially given sort of the complexity and the cloudiness of, of this problem. And, and, and yeah, there are and, no and, magic and, and, bullets. It's going to take, you know, business, it's going to take government, it's going to take politicians, it's going to take teachers and educators, and it's going to take us as individuals coming together and saying, all right, we've had enough, we're going to try something else. And that's the most important thing is it's individuals. And and the secret, by the way, is that the first part of your book is called The Way Out. There is a way out, people. And the question is whether or not we're willing to take that. So it's yeah. it's time for questions. I want to get right to them. Great. Let's try to uh, be as quick as we can with these questions because there's lots. And I appreciate Eliza and Liz and Leon working and put these questions on a list for me. I'm going to try and group some of these so we can get through as much as possible. So okay. one category of questions that I'm seeing here are people asking stuff along the lines of, is it futile to even try to get along with people that don't want to get along with you or whose only goal is triumph? Or another version of this question is that do we actually need to bother working and being around people who think differently than us, especially if if they're advocating for, you know, things like violence? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a great I guess question. where do we draw the line, you know? Yeah. Again, so um 
Uh, unfortunately, more and more of us are really seeing the others as immoral, right? Something like 72% of Republicans and 60 some percent of uh, Democrats see the other side as immoral, which means that there's like a disgust factor and we're not willing to do that. Um, so here's what I would say. What I wouldn't ask you anybody to do is to jump into a conversation over Trump or the Hunter Biden or, you know, I just think that there's nowhere to go with that. Mm. I think what we have to do is start to find the human and the other, right? And so that's why when I went for a walk with my neighbor, the first thing I said is, who are you? Where did you come from? What's your story? What, you know, what are your children doing? What's, you know, and, and I shared the same thing because I think that's where people have to start, right? What do we have in common? What, what how do we differ? Um, that kind of human story, you know, the, the, the um, Dave Isay's One Small Step group does this in their, they bringing red and blue Americans together in, on, on conversations uh, on radio, and then they share snippets of it. And what they don't do, what they say is, don't talk politics. Don't start there. Right. Just tell each other your stories and what life events have happened recently that are important to you. Like, what are the meaningful things happening to you that you want to share with somebody? Talk about those things. Uh, because we know people differ on the issues. And most of us don't know much about the issues. You know, there's a complicated right. immigration is an immensely complicated thing. And some of us also just don't care. And you know, like there's a there's a there's a whole there's a whole group of people that are just apathetic. And yeah. and I think to your point, have those politics adjacent conversations. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to add to that? Because I, well, I, I've got another question for you. No, again, I, I, I think I wouldn't say it's futile. I think it depends on what you're doing and what your objective the is. Goal. You have to ask that. Um, I think it's important that we keep trying because the trajectory we are on in this country of physically moving to, uh, away from each other, getting angry and being armed is a bad trajectory. So we all have to do what, what we can do to begin to turn the temperature down. So this is this is a, a pretty interesting self-help question. So what if you're someone who watches optimization news a lot and just feels a lot of rage? You yeah. try and it just is irritating. You read their book and it's yeah. angering. Yeah. Um, how do you respond to that impulse? And it almost makes you think of your walking story, but how do you respond to that impulse of anger or frustration? Yeah, so one of the things that the neuroscientists are telling us is that that dynamic is um, is an addictive substance, right? The fact that when, when you feel outraged and triggered by the other side and feel a taste for retaliation, it triggers pleasure centers in the brain that are also triggered by heroin, right? And social media platforms understand that and prey on it. Mainstream media preys on that, This and politicians prey on that. So in some ways, we're being played and manipulated. And this addiction that we have to outrage is being used against us. So I think that's important to recognize, is that you don't have to do that. Again, what I've done in my consumption of media is find people that I don't think are they're not they're not crazy right and they often have have valid points of view that my side is not talking about but that need to be heard and sometimes they piss me off yeah but there's more of a balance so again what's important is that it's not that you listen to anybody on the other side it's listen that you try to identify people that you feel are decent well-intentioned but have a different point of view you know there are sources for this right now you'd ask how do you find those you know, the flip side, all sides, there are these media groups that are trying to curate, you know, thoughtful, well-intentioned people on different sides of issues, and then share them with you in an email for a five-minute read a day, just to give you some exposure to some of these people. That's where I would start, because they're not people, yeah, I will think, well, that's wrong, or I don't right. agree with that argument, but they're not using rhetoric that just intentionally provokes. And the other part of it is that I think oftentimes when we think of having a conversation with somebody we disagree with, we think that that person is going to be either Tucker Carlson or Rachel Maddow, right? Like not every conversation goes no. to <laughs> the extreme. Thank, There's a whole spectrum God. out there. Yeah, yeah. thank God. Thank yeah. God. Yeah. Um, though on the other hand, man, that society would be uh, fascinating. Um, so, <laughs> so can society survive without a, a shared value system? 
I think we do have shared values. I mean, one of the interesting things about the research that Jonathan uh, Haidt does and others on moral differences between red and blue Americans is that we all have a, a, a lot of the same values. It's kind of relatively what's more important than others. It's right. not that you know some group only believe in care and justice and the others only believe in purity and order. You know, It's like we all need a lot of that stuff um, we differ in how much of it, you know, where we lean. I think that's important. Human beings in some ways share a lot of our DNA and a lot of our basic values and needs. They're definitely, you know, when we're politically weaponized and weaponized through outrage, we start to believe that the other side is much more extreme on things than they are. Um, and so we, we, we lose sight of the fact that we have things in common. I went for a walk with this guy. We found out that actually, you know, there are interesting connections that I had no idea that we had. They're there. And those commonalities, those values, shared values are there if we look for them. We don't look for them and they're never sold to us by the media. Right. And in some cases, you you might even argue that they, they have a profit incentive to not share those stories because yeah, look, money is made in division. Money, money division... You know, uh, if it ble- if it what is it if it if it bleeds it reads I can't remember yep. what yep. you know provocative things are what capture the attention. We're in an attention economy. We, people need to be drawn. You know, th- these companies, social media and media companies and politicians believe that the more provocative they are, the more contentious the the content, the more we stay on their platforms. And there's evidence that that supports it, and it's toxic right? And it's contributing. So it is their business model. Facebook has known for a long time that the leadership in Facebook, that they're of the consequences of what they do, not only in genocides around the world, but also in polarization and then alienation and depression and those kinds of things. But it's their business model. And so they're unwilling to do what needs needs to happen in order to safeguard the population. That's a, that's a crime. Mm. And I know our our mutual um, friend John Height has a lot of work on this, where he's really hammered pretty intently on the fact that there's a real crisis that needs to be addressed in the context of social media. So, you know, we've talked a lot about individual actions. Let's yeah. get back to the level of legislation. So, one of the questions we have is about whether or not we can legislate our way towards interconnectivity. And an example they they use is. You know, can we mandate potentially that people within a certain proximity from one another must meet certain demographic variation? Is that yeah. possible? Yeah, it's a great question. And other countries have done that. Botswana did that when they achieved independence. They forced members of different ethnic groups to every seven years, if they're civil servants, requirement of their, which is like 50% of the working population, uh, a requirement is that every seven years they move to a different part of the nation and basically become ambassadors for their group, right? And so, and they believe that's been helpful. That's been, a, 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 it's, it's not convenient, but it's been helpful in mitigating inter-ethnic tribalism and, and violence that happened in the other places like Angola and Mozambique that got independence at the same time. So they, they've seen that kind of policy helpful. It's a tough thing to do. Here's my challenge right now. When Biden was, uh, elected and was in a transition team, they reached out to me through Tim Shriver and Unite and said, what, is, what should we do? We want to do a, a unifying America, bringing the soul of America back together program. And I said, you can't because you're, you're the problem for half the country. You're, you, you know, have, have taken this position illegally, you know, all of that stuff. You mm-hmm. can't do an explicit thing like that and not just have half the country show up. But what you can do is not make it worse through vitriol and rhetoric and to start to work on the kind of longer term things. So the government in many ways is constrained. What Congress is doing is they're trying to work within their, where they have latitude. How do you change the culture of Congress? How do you change how they do problem solving? That's what they're doing. They can't change the party system. It's, it's beyond their control. So they're finding where they can have an impact. And I think that's really important because, you know, my recommendation to to, uh, Biden was 
you can't do this, but you know who can? So there's a great thing that's happened. I'm sure, Monty, you're aware of this. The report came out last week or two weeks ago. There are these volunteer organizations in the country, right? Habitat for Humanity, the YMCA, WCA, uh, Mercy Corps, all of these groups. These groups do good work for communities, right? They build homes for the poor in their neighborhood, right? That's what ha Habitat Humanity is about, helping house the homeless or the, right? Um, they're not there to bridge political divides, but what these groups have been doing is they've been meeting with a group called Convergence to mm -hmm. think about, is there ways that when we bring these people together to do good work for the community, that we can think about who we bring together and how we do it in ways right. that help start to increase co connection across differences, right? And have some intentionality to that in a way that doesn't mess up what they're doing, right? Because you can overplay that hand and then people get suspicious about building homes for the poor. That would be a disaster, right? So how do you use this infrastructure we have of volunteerism, which this country has a long history of, and a, a, a huge infrastructure for, and how do you intentionally start to introduce different people together so that they're right. working together and have a different experience of each other? That's yeah. an extremely promising initiative that's not top-down regulation. Each of these groups are doing it in their own way, at their own pace. That's very important. Um, but it is an example of something that's out there, this volunteerism process, um, that can be better marshaled. It can be married almost. It can be merged into this process of creating more interconnectivity. I have to say, as, as, a, as a board member of Convergence, I would say that Folks, if they don't know the organization, Convergence has a lot of these interesting dialogues with top-level stakeholders. They're, they're doing one on digital discourse. Um, it's going to meet on September 21st. There's a lot of groups and efforts like this. In fact, I think um, the Village Square team has been putting different organizations in the chat. You and the audience has the ability to take action because it's going to take all of us. It starts with us. Um, yes. Man, I should I should start raking in this commission. Um, <laughs> all right. So, so I've got two last questions for you. One is on... Uh, similarly along the lines of sort of the privilege question I asked you, which is how is healing possible if one group says to another that you can't exist or that yeah. you can never understand my experience or you're not welcome in my circle? Yeah. Um, oftentimes on campuses, the version of that question we get is, uh, you know, let's say that you're trying to talk to one group and that group says that, you know, this type of people, you know, don't necessarily exist. Yeah. And, and those those types of interactions seem to be increasing. So how, how do you deal and contend with that? Yeah, again, um, the first thing you have to do, again, is assume that they're not all the same, right? That there may be some that are violent and inclined to that, that say, cast aspersions, do harmful things. But we can't assume that an entire group of people is the same, right? So Again, what we're talking, who we're trying to talk to is the, say, 85% of middle Americans that don't do that. Mm -hmm. Not the extremes that are, let's burn the place down, let's take over the capital. We're trying to talk to the other folks. There are a lot of people in there that are worth talking to and worth reaching out to. That's an important thing to, to, to consider. You know, what you don't do, like my colleagues that do international peace building, when there's a war and a conflict zone you and the war ends, you never go into that and say, all right, time to do reconciliation because they will kill you. <laughs> you know? They will say, don't use that word here. Sure. Give us 10 years and maybe we can start to think about what that means. But we are filled with rage. This country is in a, in a place where there's so much energy for the fight. And I am, I'm not encouraging certainly citizens to try to reach out to more extreme actors and extreme voices. I don't think that's useful. I think people like you, Mano, people that are trained and, and, and know how to bring, in some ways, volatile people together, sometimes under some conditions, when they have a shared goal, they can come together and make a huge difference. I, I, I write about the, the Boston abortion women that came together in the beginning of The Way Out. These were three pro-life and pro-choice women who'd spent their, their careers agitating against the other side. Then there was a horrible violent incident and they said, okay, 
we're we're somewhat responsible for this. We have to figure out a way to talk to each other. It was hard work. It had to be well facilitated. It took a long time, but it was a very powerful thing. Those people have a lot of energy, so we don't want to give up on them. But I'm not asking regular citizens to reach out to them. I'm asking you, Mono. I'm asking the Village Square people. I'm you know I'm asking people that that are listening, that are participating. Yeah, that have those kinds of skills and support that you could do that. There is a lot of promise there. Most people don't. And those people, I would encourage them to reach out to people that are not too extreme, not too terrifying, frankly. You know, that it's unethical to do that. Sure. Well, I I think that's right. And I think it it's going to really take an, an all out effort. I've got one one sort of last question for you. And then uh, just so the audience knows, we're going to drop a, a post event survey in the chat. Please fill that out. It'll help us think through how these events are going, how we can make them better. Um, but I would just say, you know, and this co- kind of goes along the lines that you just ended on, which is what would your response be to those who believe that conflict or violence is the only solution? And that's the only path forward, you know, because I, I know that people that are going to listen to this, they're going to feel a little bit of hope. And then five, 10 minutes later, maybe 30 minutes later, you know, the the one news and they'll hear somebody call for a national divorce or they'll hear somebody, you know, throw something around. They hear their neighbor say something that they deeply disagree with. Um, could you leave us with a little bit of 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 sort of, thinking on how to respond to that instinct. Yeah, I mean, again, I've tracked the the trends in this country pretty carefully and closely. And what I would say is we're not there yet. We're at a place where the probability of violence is increasing. And hopefully the um, security apparatus of this country, the FBI, the police, sheriffs, you know, are monitoring and doing the best they can to constrain that and contain that. That's their job. They're using kind of pro-social force to con- con- constrain that capacity. Our job as citizens is to grow an alternative, to grow a different kind of culture. And, and, and in doing so, you basically reduce the support for more extreme actors. If your brother is starting to gather weapons and talk about something, the onus is on you to knock on his door and say, I love you. And I- I can't support you on this. You know, mm-hmm. I really have to push back against you. It is that is our responsibility. That's the that's what we can do to mitigate that kind of harm. Hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's powerful, and I think it speaks to the urgency of the moment. And again, we're gonna we're gonna drop the the link in the chat. If you can answer the questions while we're finishing up tonight's program, with this last question, and yeah. there's a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. So don't miss out on the gift card. Um, I'm gonna do it. I, I know, I know. I'm gonna do it. I'm I'm in need. You know, I I wanna I wanna close with this because I think again you talk about both the the deep system that is the problem and yet yeah. the the possibility for hope and optimism that there is a hopeful majority of us out there that are willing to get involved and get active. And I wanna yeah. bring readers to this uh, story that you talk about um, because it, it talks about the the top line being that the the wolf who wins is the one you feed. So you begin the book with this tale about a Cherokee elder, and I want to I read it. Right. A fight is going on inside you. It is a terrible fight between two wolves. One wolf represents fear, anger, envy, greed, arrogance, and ego. The other stands for joy, peace, love, hope, kindness, generosity, and faith. The same fight going on inside you is inside every other person too. So the child thought about it for a moment and then asked, which wolf will win? But the old man replied, the one you feed. How do you think about that in this moment? Again, we, you know, we all have all of that in us. And that's the profound question of the day is, there's so much pulling us towards the fight and the arrogance and the resistance and the attack. And yet that what happens when you do that is the other side of you is diminished and dwindles. You know, Gandhi knew this. Gandhi knew the consequences of violent actions, that it has a negative effect on us and our relationships and our communities. We have to shift the balance. We have to really spend more time thinking about how do we feed these this other doesn't mean we have to give up the the, the wolf doesn't mean that we have to give up the violent the, the fight it does mean that violence and tipping into that 
is a pathology. It's a dangerous path to take, and it would, you know, bring dire consequences to our society. Well, Dr. Coleman, I just want to say that I I deeply appreciate your time, and I also appreciate the the level of candor and honesty and also just simplicity with which you articulate a lot of the concepts in the book. And I think people find that relatable. And also for your vulnerability, I just want to remind everybody again that the link is in the chat, the way out, how to overcome toxic polarization. And if you're somebody based in Tallahassee, there's a local bookstore that you can pick it up at right now. Um, and so I, I I deeply feel that it's it's important for us to be able to understand these problems. And so I think your book does a really good job of that. Mano, I really appreciate it. And I, I, want, I want to thank you. You're fantastic. <laughs> it was a pleasure to talk to you about, you know, you have such, you bring such rep, uh, information and, and important references, but also just a lightness in your touch, which is fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. And I just want to leave folks with two other quick things. If you liked this type of conversation, we're launching this podcast called The Hopeful Majority. We just actually had Dr. Coleman Vivek Ramaswamy on today, um, GOP presidential candidate. And I think a lot of these conversations, we try to have them the exact same way so that people can feel like they can really get behind the scenes of power, understand that there's a lot of nuance to have. So that's one thing. Second, if you've got college students, high school students, Get them to start Bridge USA chapters. We're building that movement. If you want to take the challenge, starts with us. The political courage challenge that Dr. Coleman has has created. There's so many other organizations out there. If you're based in Tallahassee, check out the Village Square. And finally, um, I just want to thank Florida Humanities, the Village Square, myself from Bridge USA. Uh, thank you, everybody, for another wonderful program. And your attendance and participation is what keeps this program going. And I want to thank Liz and Leon and Eliza and everybody else. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Thank you so much. I I support everything you just said. Take care, everybody. All right. You're well.